PVL 3701 Study Unit 3 Ownership Definition of Limitations on Ownership Number 1 Definition of Ownership 1.1 1 .1. Introduction this study unit contains a detailed discussion of the concept of ownership. As a student of property law, you should be able to define ownership and to name and describe the elements of ownership. The concept ownership has developed over centuries and may have a different content in different societies or political and economic systems. It is therefore not a static concept but one that is continuously being adapted to suit the needs of the society in which it operates. Ownership can be defined as the most comprehensive real right that a person can have with regards to his or her thing. In principle, a person can act upon and with his or her thing as he or she pleases. This apparent freedom is restricted, however, by the law and the rights of others. Although, in principle, ownership is the most comprehensive real right a person can have to his or her thing, it is not unlimited. The limitations on ownership may change from time to time and from community to community. The law may limit ownership for various reasons, for example, to protect the environment, to benefit specific communities or the community as a whole, to regulate urbanization, to harmonize conflicting interests of individual owners among themselves or with other members of society. Therefore, the society in which ownership functions will determine the nature and content of ownership. In discussing real rights, we distinguish between ownership, which is a right to one's own thing, ice in re propria, and various limited real rights, which are rights to another person's things. Here we are in re aliena. Ownership can be defined with reference to its inviolability, its inherent nature or its entitlements. 1.2. Inviolability. Inviolability of ownership refers to the principle that a person cannot lose his or her ownership without his or her consent. With its corollary that a person cannot pass a better title than he or she has. The latter principle is expressed in the Roman law maxim, Nemo plus juris in oleum transferre potest quam ipse harboret. No one may transfer more rights to another person than he has himself. For example, if X sells and delivers wise things, thing to Z, Z does not become the owner of the thing. Although the contract of sale is valid, Y can claim the thing from Z with the re vindicatio, that is, a real action. Z can have recourse against X in terms of the contract of sale. 1.3. Inherent Nature Ownership is often described as the most comprehensive real right a person can have to his or her thing. This comprehensiveness refers not only to the fact that an owner can enforce his or her ownership against the world at large, but it also refers to the number of entitlements, or the extent of the entitlements, flowing from the ownership. Ownership can therefore be defined with reference to its inherent nature and its entitlements. Because of these inherent entitlements of ownership, we often find references to the absolute or individualistic nature of ownership. In Gien versus Gien 1979, the court defined ownership with reference to its inherent nature as the, point, as the most comprehensive real right a person can have to a thing. The point of departure is that a person can do with his or her thing as that person pleases. This apparent freedom is restricted, however, by the law and the rights of others. Consequently, no owner ever has an unlimited right to exercise his or her entitlements in absolute freedom in his or her own discretion. These limitations on ownership are fully discussed, in, discussed later in the study unit.
Okay, just to read the examples here. Um, example 1 on page 43. Uh, in terms of the Physical Planning Act 125 of 1991 and the Development Facilitation Act 67 of 1995, the three farms in our example are situated in an area which, in terms of the Regional Development Plan for that area, may be used for agricultural purposes only. Example number two. X and Y are seriously affected by baboons that destroy their maize plants. X installs an apparatus to chase away the baboons on the boundary with his neighbor. The apparatus makes loud noise, noises at regular intervals during the day and night. The neighbor writes to X and Y to complain about the noise during the night. But X, X, <laughs> but X, X ignores the letter and refuses to speak to his neighbor on the telephone. X and his neighbor are not on speaking terms because his neighbor seriously insulted him a few years ago. Example 2 is based on the case we referenced, Gien vs. Gien, 1979. Okay, example number 3. X and Y are owners of their farm, Waterford. X and Y's ownership of Waterford is limited by M's rights of habitation, that is, a personal servitude or a limited real right. M exercises her personal her servitude personally. M's right of habitation determines that as long as she lives, X and Y will not be able to evict her or interfere with her right of habitation. Her limited real right of servitude to live in the homestead limits X and Y's ownership of Waterford. Okay, example number four. Q and R are owners of the form Pulang. The ownership of Pulang is limited by S's right to drive over the form. S is entitled to this servitude in his capacity as owner of Highlands, a land servitude. In terms of his limited real right, S in his capacity as owner of Highlands may drive over Q and R's form Pulang without disturbance. Therefore, Q and R cannot for example, place an obstruction in the road or prevent S from using the road just because they are angry with him. Example number five. S is the owner of his farm Highlands. S obtained a loan from the bank for improvements that he wishes to make on Highlands. As security for repayment of his loan, he registers a mortgage bond over the farm in favor of the bank. S's ownership of the farm is limited by the bank's right of mortgage. The bank's right of mortgage limits S's ownership of the farm highlands. During the currency of the mortgage, as long as S's principal debt to the bank has not been paid, S's ownership is restricted in the sense that he is not entitled to sell or burden the farm without the permission of the bank. Furthermore, in terms of the mortgage, the bank may request the court to declare the form executable if S is unable to repay the loan. I think there's a note, personal rights or creditors' rights are less limiting than limited real rights. Okay, example number six. X and Y are owners of their form Waterford. Their ownership of Waterford is also limited by S's personal right, or creditor's right, which arises from a contract in terms of which S may graze 100 head of cattle on the farm. S's personal right, or creditor's right, in terms of the contract is not as strong as M's right of habitation, in example 3 above. X and Y have entered into a contract with S in terms of which they are limiting their ownership by agreement. In terms of this agreement, S may graze 100 head of cattle on the farm. In terms of the contract, S has a personal right or creditor's right which entitles him to graze cattle on the farm for the period determined in the contract. If X and Y prevent S from entering the farm, they will be in breach of the terms of the contract. Furthermore, if they sell the farm to Z, a third person, S cannot rely on the contract 
to force Z to allow him to graze the cattle on the farm. On the other hand, if X and Y sell the farm, the ownership of the new owner of the farm will still be limited by M's right of habitation. Okay, 1.4. Entitlements. A legal subject who acquires a real right from a real relationship is usually entitled by the legal order to perform certain acts in connection with the thing. For example, he or she may use or sell the thing. The capacity is conferred on the legal subject by virtue of a right, in this case, the real right of ownership, are called entitlements. Entitlements, therefore, emanates from rights, on the basis of which a legal subject may perform certain acts in regard to the thing. Note that in some textbooks, the term powers is used to describe the content of ownership. However, from a theoretical point of view, it is better to refer to entitlements in describing the content of a right such as ownership. The entitlements of ownership include the entitlement to use and enjoy the thing, enjoy the fruits, control or possess the thing, consume or destroy the thing, alienate the thing, burden the thing or vindicate the thing. 1.4.1 Use and Enjoy An owner's entitlement to use and enjoy the thing is generally the most important entitlement of ownership. People, can, people acquire ownership of things because they wish to use and enjoy them. By making use of the entitlement to burden the thing, an owner voluntarily limits the entitlement of use, for example by granting a right of habitation. In this case, the servitude holder has the use and enjoyment of the thing and the owner no longer has the use. See the position of M in example 1 above. 1.4.2 Fruits An owner is also entitled to the natural and civil fruits of the thing. 1.4.3 Control An owner has the entitlement to physically control the thing. By making use of his or her entitlement to burden an owner may, for example, pledge a thing. The owner then transfers control of the thing to the pledgee and therefore the owner no longer has control. 1.4.4 Consume or destroy An owner is entitled to consume or destroy the thing. An issue which is becoming more and more controversial is whether an owner can actually destroy the thing. Here the question arises whether the state can, for example, deny an owner the possibility of destroying a thing that is scarce or valuable to the community as a whole. Think of cultural objects or valuable artworks. The answer to this question will be determined by the way in which society views the object in question and sees its role in determining the nature of ownership. 1.4.5 Alienate An owner is entitled to alienate the thing by means of sale or donation and transfer of ownership. Ownership of the thing passes to the buyer or the donee only upon transfer of ownership. In the case of movables, this takes place by means of delivery, and in the case of immovables, by means of registration. Ownership can only be transferred to a third person by the owner or by someone who has been authorized to do so. This is in accordance with the inviolability principle of ownership, which derives from Roman from the Roman law maxim, Nemo plus Eurus in alium transfer protest quam ipse haberet. Therefore, where a non-owner sells the thing, the sale is valid, but the seller cannot transfer ownership. 1.4.6 Burden An owner is entitled to burden the thing by granting other people limited real rights to the thing, such as limited real rights such limited real rights will limit or burden the ownership. See examples 3, 4 and 5 above. In such a case, the owner's ownership is limited or burdened in that some of the entitlements are frozen for as long as the pledge or mortgage is in existence. 1.4.7 Vindicate 
Because of the inviolability of ownership, an owner is entitled to claim his or her thing from anyone who is unlawfully in control of the thing, simply by proving ownership. The defendant must then raise and prove a valid defence. This common law principle seems to be undergoing a change in regard to immovable property in South African courts. Study Unit 3 Limitations on Ownership Number 1 Introduction As we indicated above, ownership is, in principle, the most comprehensive real right a person can have to a thing. This extensive right is, however, subject to limitations. On the one hand, it is limited by law, and on the other, it is limited by the rights of other legal subjects. Ownership is limited as follows. First, limitations imposed by law. These limitations can be subdivided into, first, statutory limitations, and secondly, limitations imposed in terms of neighbour law principles. Secondly, limitations imposed by the rights of other legal subjects, as in examples 3, 4, 5 and 6 above. These limitations can be subdivided into, first, limitations imposed by the limited real rights of third parties, and secondly, limitations imposed by the personal rights or creditors' rights of third parties. Okay, and now for number two, limitations imposed by law. 2.1. Statutory limitations. A distinction can be drawn be here between statutory limitations on movable things and immovable things. There is such a long list of these limitations that it is almost impossible to discuss them. For interest's sake, we refer you to the following examples of limitations. A. Limitations in the Constitution, such as Section 25 and 23 of the Constitution. B. Limitations on the use of movable things, such as the Firearms Control Act 60 of 2000, which controls firearms. Secondly, the National Road Traffic Act 93 of 1996, which controls motor vehicles. And then the Drugs and Drugs Trafficking Act 140 of 1992, which controls drugs. C. Limitations on immovable things. Here it just states land. The sub for example, the Subdivision of Agricultural Land Act 70 of 1970 and Spatial Planning and Land Use Management Act 16 of 2013. Okay, 2.2 Neighbor Law. In Study Unit 1, we indicated that it is the function of the law of things to regulate and harmonize conflicting ownership rights. One of the ways of achieving this is to restrict ownership in the interests of neighbours. Where property, properties border on one another, the manner in which one of the owners uses his or her property may considerably influence the other owner's enjoyment of their property. A conflict of ownership rights may develop and the principles of neighbour law regulate these possible conflicts. The following instances of the application of neighbour law can be distinguished. First, nuisance. Secondly, lateral and surface support. Thirdly, encroachments. Fourthly, surface water. Fifth, party walls and fences. And number six, elimination of dangers. Let's first um, consider nuisance 2.2.1. Neighbour law deals with the limitations placed on owners in the exercise of their entitlements as owners, in the interests of neighbours. Interests must be balanced against one another and the criterion by which this balancing of interests takes place is that of reasonableness. Neighbours are expected to behave reasonably towards one another, as quoted in the case of Mulharba versus Sierra's Municipality 1951. An owner must therefore exercise his or her entitlement as owner reasonably 
and the neighbor must endure such exercise in a reasonable way. A certain degree of tolerance is expected of neighbors in exercise of their entitlements as owners. The standard to be applied was formulated in Prince, Prince Lewis v. Shaw, 1938. The standard to be taken must not be that of the perverse or finicking or overscrupulous person, but of the normal man of sound and liberal tastes and habits. In neighbor law, situations be distinguished with nuisance in a narrow sense and nuisance in a broad sense. In the narrow sense, a nuisance occurs where a neighbor's right of personality or entitlement of use is infringed by, for example, noise or smell. This infringement does not necessarily result in damage, but rather in a personality infringement. These remedies are a prohibitory interdict and or a claim for delictual compensation. Nuisance in the broad sense results in damage to property and the remedies are, prohib are a prohibitory interdict and or a claim for delictual damages. Regal v. African Superslate 1963 dealt with nuisance in a broad sense, as seen in example 3. The court had to decide whether an interdict can be awarded to prevent future damage to the neighbouring property where the source of the nuisance was created by a previous owner of the property. It has been held by the court that the current owner of the farm cannot be held responsible for damage caused by the use of the property by a previous owner. The court further held that neighbour law is based on the principle of reasonableness. If it was reasonably possible for the current owner to prevent the damage from happening again in the future, the failure to do so would amount to an unlawful act. This would entitle the neighbour the neighbor to an interdict and or a delictual claim for damages. The court held that the current owner had acted reasonably. You will notice that the remedies in neighbour law are both, are both property law remedies and delictual remedies. The requirements for an interdict are discussed below, as well as the requirements for a claim for delictual damages. Neighbour law is discussed fully in the module on the law of delict. 2.2.2 Lateral and Surface Support Every owner of a piece of land is entitled to support from his or her neighbour's land. This means that an owner cannot make excavations on his or her land which result in his or her neighbour's land subsiding. Should this occur, the owner who made the excavations is liable for the damage caused to the neighbour's land, even in the absence of fault, since this is a strict form this is a form of strict liability, that is liability without fault. This principle, however, applies only where the land is still in its natural state. Once the state, the natural state has been changed by, for example, building on it, this rule no longer applies. Today, in most cities and towns, extensive building regulations regulate the position. 2.2.3 Encroachments Where owners encroach on their neighbour's land, the rules regarding encroachments come into operation. A distinction is drawn between buildings and trees. The latter are subdivided in branches and roots. 2.2.3.1 Buildings The owner of the land on which an encroachment has taken place can use one of the following remedies. First, the owner can claim removal of the encroachment. The owner cannot, however, remove the encroachment because he or she cannot take the law into his or her own hands. Removal cannot be claimed if he or she stood by and with full knowledge of the facts did not insist on removal. The fact th <laughs> the courts have a discretion in deciding whether, or whether to order removal or payment of compensation. The court can also order transfer of the piece of land encroached upon to the encroacher, in which situation number three below will apply. Okay, um, number two, the owner can claim ejectment from his or her land against payment of 
compensation for the enhancement of his or her property. On the grounds of equity and convenience, the courts can also order transfer of the land encroached upon against payment of compensation. Number three, the owner can claim that the encroacher should take transfer of the land encroached upon and pay compensation. This compensation is determined with reference to, first, all costs of the transfer, including the costs of a survey and diagrams, secondly, the value of the land, and lastly, solatium, that is, compensation for personality infringement for the trespass and involuntary deprivation of land. 2.2.3.2 Trees. 2.2.3.2.1. Branches. If trees are planted so close to the boundary that the branches encroach upon the neighbour's land, the neighbour can request the owner of the trees to remove the branches. If the owner refuses, the neighbour can approach the court for an order compelling the owner to do so, or the neighbour can do it himself. The neighbour may not keep the branches, however, unless the owner consents or fails to remove them within a reasonable time after dem demand. 2.2.3.2.2 Roots In principle, the, the principles outlined above should apply to roots. There is clear authority for the principle that the neighbour may remove roots encroaching on his or her land but little authority on the question whether he or she may compel the owner of the plants to do, do so. In Bingham v. City, the City Council of Johannesburg, 1934, the roots of trees destroyed the neighbor's flower garden. It was held that the owner of the trees had to remove the trees since they had caused a nuisance. The owner had to remove, had to remove the nuisance itself not merely the encroachment. In Smith v. Basson, 1979, where roots and plants intruded five metres into the neighbour's land, the court held that the neighbour could remove the roots and plants. The court left the question open whether the neighbour could claim damages from the owner or could compel him to remove the encroachments. 2.2.4 Surface Water Every owner of land has to receive the natural flow of water from adjoining land. The upper owner may not, however, interfere with the natural flow of water in a manner prejudicial to the lower owner. In a ru rural tenement, the lower owner can institute the Actio Aqua Pluvia Arsendia, by means of which he or she can claim removal of any works causing such interference, as well as damages for damage sustained after litis contestatio, close of pleadings. In an urban tenement, the water should be diverted to the nearest street, and only if that is not possible can it be diverted onto the lower tenement, provided all reasonable precautions have been taken to avoid damage to the lower tenement. In Popolardo v. Hau 2010, the court held that the owner of the lower tenement must allow the natural flow of water from the higher tenement onto his tenement. Owners of urban tenements can institute the Actio Negatoria de Stilicidio Falflumen, in terms of which the lower owner denies that he or she is liable to receive drippings or a stream of water from the upper tenement. In Redlingais v. Bazzoni, 1976, the court laid down the following criteria to determine whether one is dealing with a rural or urban tenement. First, the size of the land concerned. Secondly, the extent of the building development in the catchment and drainage area. And third, the identifiability of the original topographical qualities of the land. In applying these principles, the court came to the conclusion that a stand in Arcadia 
an old suburb of Pretoria, was still rural land and the owner of the lower tenement could rely on the Axio Aqua Pluvia Arsendia. Okay, <laughs> 2.2.5. Party walls and fences. A party wall is a wall built on the boundary between two pieces of land in such a manner that it stands partly on the land of one owner and partly on the neighbouring owner's land. It is irrelevant who erected the wall. Each owner is the owner of that part of the wall which, it is, which is on his or her property and has a servitude of lateral support over the part of the wall which is on the other side. A party wall may not be demolished without the consent of the other owner. Subject, however, to the exception that a wooden fence may be demolished and replaced by a brick wall. Both owners are liable for the maintenance of the wall unless one of the owners has abandoned his part of the wall in favour of his or her neighbour. Both owners should refrain from doing anything which could affect the stability of the wall. Each owner is entitled to beautify his or her section of the wall or to extend his or her section of the wall. 2.2.6 Elimination of da Dangers Liability for the creation of danger is dealt with extensively in the law of delict. However, it is important to note here that an owner has a duty to remove or eliminate dangerous situations on his property, for example, the storing of poisonous substances, or the keeping of vicious dogs, etc. Number 3. Limitations imposed by rights of other legal subjects. 3.1. Limited real rights. Example 1. M has a personal servitude of habitation over a homestead on X and Y's farm. Example number 2. S has a right of way over Q and R's farm Poulain. And then example number 3. S has obtained a loan from the bank for improvements that he wishes to make on his farm. Highlands. As security for repayment of the loan, he registers a mortgage bond in favour of the bank over the farm. Regarding exa example 1 above, you should note that M's right of habitation limits X and Y's ownership until her death or until she abandons her right. Before that time, they cannot evict her from the homestead or interfere with her in any way. If X and Y sell the farm to Z, M can still enforce her right against Z. Regarding example 2, note that Q and R's ownership is limited by S's right of way. Right of way. Regarding example 3, it should be borne in mind that S's ownership is limited by the bank's right of mortgage. During the currency of the mortgage, as long as Ace's principal debt to the bank has not been discharged. Charged. Ace's ownership is restricted in the sense that he is not entitled to sell or burden the farm without the permission of the bank. Furthermore, in terms of the mortgage, the bank can apply to the court to declare the farm executable if Ace is unable to repay the loan. 3.2. Personal rights or creditors' rights or claims. The example here is... S has a contract with X and Y in terms of which he may graze 100 head of cattle on the farm Waterford. As long as the example above is concerned, you should note that the operation of S's personal right or creditor's right is not as limiting as the operation of M's limited real right over X and Y's ownership. X and Y can, for example, prohibit S at any time from grazing his cattle on the farm. S can not force them to allow him to graze his cattle on the farm. His remedy would be based on breach of contract in terms of which he could claim damages and or specific performance. If X and Y sell their farm to Z after a few months, S cannot force Z to allow him to graze his cattle on the farm. Personal rights or creditors' rights do not operate against third parties in principle.